Hi everyone, welcome to the Physionic Podcast. In today's episode, I had the absolute pleasure of having my friend Alex Soiree on to discuss two primary topics. First, we discuss a bit of basic immunology and microbiology, and then we jump into fungi or fungi, how they affect us and how our body deals with them. Alex is getting her PhD in microbiology and immunology and also happens to be heavily involved in AWIS, which is the Association for Women in Science, which is a nonprofit that attempts to help women advance in the STEM fields by providing opportunities and networking possibilities. If you're interested, you can check out the links that I've attached to this content. Alex is a really sharp, smart scientist and brings a lot of information that I was at the time of this recording completely unaware. So I'm looking forward to this podcast for you as it was a blast to listen to her expertise. I did have some audio issues, but I fixed them pretty well. So if you hear my voice drop to a low bass, I promise you I'm not trying to impress you with any depth of my voice. But with that said, let's jump into it. All right, well, welcome to the Physionic Podcast. Today, I have a another special guest. A few weeks ago, I had Garrett Bunce, which actually Alex knows as well. Uh, he talked about neurology and neuroscience and transhumanism and whatnot. And I thought, again, because of the whole quarantine situation that uh, I might as well take advantage of the fact that I have so many intelligent people around me that know so much about these different areas of medicine. So <laughs> it's okay if you want to laugh. It's perfectly okay. No, it's flattering. <laughs> it's flattering. It's very flattering. It's like the nicest thing you said about me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I gave you a compliment earlier too. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time, Nick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I decided to have... Um, Alex Soiree <laughs> on, on the podcast. We were just discussing how, how I pronounce her last name. Anyway, uh, but I wanted to have Alex on because uh, she knows quite a lot. Well, she's an immunology student, and I'll have her talk about kind of her education in just a second. But I also wanted to talk about uh, fungi, which is something that she's studying. And I, to be frank, I know nothing. Like I've done zero research on fungi whatsoever at this point. So this is going to be a ground up education for me as well. So anyway, Alex, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't know anything about fungi until I started studying it too. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit, like to start off, just like about your educational background, like bachelor's, master's, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. So um, I got my bachelor's degree at Sewanee University of the South, which is in um, Tennessee. And my bachelor's degree was actually in international and global health, I but I minored in biology. I was really interested in um, infectious diseases in a public health standpoint. standpoint. Well, at the, at the time, I was just interested in health in a, um, in a more social standpoint. But then I started reading some studies on tuberculosis and other infectious diseases, and I got really interested in the, in the science behind it. So after I graduated, I got my master's degree at Tulane in uh, microbiology and immunology. And there I worked in a vaccine development lab under John Clemens, and I kind of like fell in love with the field of microbiology and immunology. And after that, I spent four years um, doing research in New York City. Two years were spent with Jonathan Lai at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where we did research on engineering a uh, viral immunotherapeutics, so engineering potential um, therapeutics that could be used in uh, treating viral diseases. And then two years with Talia Swartz and Benjamin Chen at Mount Sinai, at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where I studied HIV-associated inflammation. And now I'm at UMB with dear Nicholas over here, <laughs> where I am studying a fungal diseases, specifically um, mucormycosis. Right. Yeah, so that's that's what we're going to be talking about in the latter half of, of this mm -hmm. whole podcast. Um, to start out, though, um, just because, again, I kind of want to orient people kind of starting out, we we discussed like se several questions that we go into, so kind of general immunology and things of that nature. So um, just to start off as like a base understanding for people who aren't at all familiar with immunology or anything like that, um, mm -hmm. how would you define like what is a microbe yeah. and actually also what is a host? Yeah, so um, a microbe or a microorganism is really like in the most basic sense is just a microscopic organism which ex can exist either in a single cell form or as like a colony of cells. 
but really it's just an organism that is so small that you have to use a microscope to see, you just can't see with the naked eye. And so it usually requires a lens or a microscope, but usually we use these terms to describe things like um, bacteria, fungi, uh, parasites. Um, and also, this, but this term has also been used to describe things like parasitic worms, which can be seen with the naked eye. And, but overall, the term microbe has kind of been used to basically talk about really um, these organisms that can cause diseases in a host. So you have a microbe on one end, on the other end you have a host, and the host is really the entity in which a microbe can reside or replicate. And when we discuss infectious diseases, a host is the entity where the disease is caused by the microbe. And specifically, it can respond and change its state in response to the microbe. So when we talk about immunology and immune system, the host is the one with the immune system. The host is the one that responds to it. And it's the one that can either um, sequester it or um, can develop a disease. Okay. Yeah, great. That was very succinct. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, I mean, talking about a, a topic that's really ingrained in immunology and saying yeah. it in like two minutes is, is difficult. I mean, talking to any <laughs> yeah, researcher, say, right? Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't even say that. But I would say it's more, I mean, I think what um, what I was really describing is more so on the, my, it's, so there's a field of immunology, which is the study mm. of the host. And then there's this field of microbiology, which is the study of the microbe. And um, immunology, I feel like that's a whole, like that's a whole plethora of information. Microbiology too, but microbe, I think when we talk about microbes, it's really just, you know, that's considered like the field of microbiology versus like, see, this is such, this seems like very, um, common sense, I think, but um, it sometimes it's just, in, just to like distinguish between the two, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Again, something that I probably just learned because <laughs> to try to decide for the, I mean, I, I understood what immunology was, but I didn't fully understand what microbiology was. I mean, there's all these mm -hmm. different terms for, for what these different things are. Um, yeah. So anyway, so with with that definition that you just said, would you say that a microbe is the same as a pathogen then? No, no, not always, because I think for a long, well, for a long time, I think it was kind of just that the two were kind of thought hand in hand. A pathogen is a type of microbe, but a microbe isn't always a pathogen. When we talk about pathogens, pathogens are usually what causes a pathogenic disease. You know, it's what causes, like in the context of now, um, COVID-19. Um, but not all bacteria, not all fungi, not all viruses cause diseases. And so um, we act, so now we know that the microbiome, for example, that, that constitutes a bunch of microbes that are in us, and we actually require these microbes to live. Um, they help break down our food, and, and, um, they, and they can actually help with um, protection against other diseases and help us in, um, in our immune responses against other bacteria or fungi or, any other, or other pathogens. So microbes are really, uh, the, the field of microbiology is not just limited to those that cause diseases. There's so many functions to these organisms, whether it is through um, humans or even through like the environment, like soil microbiology is its own field. Like there's so many things, there's, there's so many aspects of microbiology that really isn't fully, un that is so, I think, underappreciated and like, even someone like myself, someone who's getting like a PhD in microbiology and immunology, like I don't, like I will never fully understand the full scope of all these microbes out there. Hmm. It's like, uh, it's like wading into an ocean. That's interesting. It, it is, honestly, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, if, assuming that like a host is infected and presumably that would be like a person, right? Mm -hmm. um, with a pathogenic microbe. So specifically, you said there was a distinction, right? That uh, not all microbes are pathogens, mm. but pathogens are, are microbes, um, which is a nice little logical uh, aspect there. I remember taking a logic class and that was something that they really tried to drill in. Mm -hmm. um, so assuming that a host is infected with a pathogenic microbe, uh, will that host end up getting some sort of disease? Uh, no. Um, Infection does not always equal disease. And if the idea of infection equals disease, it's a kind of, it stems back to how the field of microbiology was established. I think a lot of people have maybe heard of the um, 
of the scientist Robert Koch. He was a German physician, uh, physician and scientist in the 19th century who was kind of one of the founders of clinical microbiology, and he established um, Cox postulates, which were based off his research in cholera and tuberculosis. And these were kind of generalized principles in understanding um, the link between microbes and the diseases they cause it. Um, and while these postulates were very, very much guided the field of microbiology and infectious diseases in general, the more we discover about microbes and the more we discover about infectious diseases, the more like we realize how limiting they are. For example, Cox post one of Cox's postulates is that an organism must be isolated from a disease. Uh, the, the organism that causes the disease must be isolated and grown in pure culture by itself. And this postulate actually excludes viruses because viruses can't grow by themselves in culture. Viruses require other cells to replicate and grow. But clearly viruses, as we see right now, um, are very, are still, um, I mean, are still a huge problem when it comes to infectious diseases. It's not exactly something you can dismiss. So Cox postulates, uh, they, they have these very, um, structured uh, view that there's very like kind of structured uh view on microbiology and disease in the sense that they focus from the microbial from the micro perspective and how as far as rules as what dictates an infectious disease and in the late 90s and early 2000s um there was um these two scientists at albert einstein college of medicine arturo Casadevall and lisanne uh, petrosky who started incorporating a um, more host response into how we define infectious diseases and they started something called the disease response framework and what it does is that it acknowledges that the host has as much um influence on dictating the outcome between a microbe and uh, and a host and whether it be, and whether it results from disease so you don't just get a microbe and that's it you automatically get a disease the host does have a role in it as far as like what can it can it um kill the disease does the microbe actually um i guess i'm trying to think of a good way but it's a microbe uh thrive in the host there are a lot of factors that go into the interaction between a microbe and a host that dictates the outcome disease is one of many outcomes possible between these interactions between a microbe and a host you can get um what well, like you could have one result could be mutualism, a state where the host and the micro both benefit from the interaction and they both thrive when they're in contact with each other. So you can think of that in the context of the microbiome. Or commensalism, where there isn't a clear damage to the host when it's infected with this microbe, um, it's just kind of there. Um, as well as latency, and this is a term that I think, this is a term that's used to describe infections where the host does not eliminate the microbe and the interaction is predominantly asymptomatic, but eventually the microbe, for whatever reason, may, um, I guess, spontaneously start up a infection, start up a disease. So this is really common in um, HIV, for example. HIV is very well known for having a latent period where the host, the humans, is seemingly healthy, and then for whatever reason, there's well, not, well, we do know some of the reasons, but I'm not going to get into it. But for whatever reason, they start um, getting sick. They, the, the virus starts actually causing a disease in them, AIDS. So there are many outcomes in when it comes to the interactions between a host and a microbe. Sometimes it does result in disease, sometimes it doesn't. And in the context of what's going on today, like now with COVID, we hear the term asymptomatic care, asymptomatic a lot. You know, for some reason, we don't know why some hosts don't get sick when they're affected by the microbes, while others get very, very severely sick and sometimes in a fatal way. So these are things we're still understanding um, as far as like what causes disease. Like why does why does one person get sick? Why does another not? It's really interesting, especially considering that we've we've known about microbes for for quite some time. And now, I mean, you, you said that what the early early nineteenth century you said that microbiology uh, kind of became a, an actual field. From my understanding, yeah, that's when, well, that's when Robert Koch, well, that's like, yeah, Robert Koch was, um, do, was alive and doing his work was like the late 19th century, and that's when he established Koch's postulates. I'm sure, I, I think before that, there were ideas in microbiology, but that, what, or, and like things that led to what is now considered, you know, microbiology, mm -hmm. but I feel like he, he's, always, he's always been described to me in my education as kind of one of the founders of 
what we know now as microbiology. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting to me to, to hear that, uh, I mean, we're still trying to wrap our heads around some of the, so like the base aspects of how to define exactly what uh, a microbe is, pathogens, like how they affect us, you know. Um, for, uh, for the same categorization, the latent period uh, or, or latent microbe, latent pathogen, however you want to define mm-hmm. it, um, would you say that herpes also falls under that? Just because yeah. a person doesn't have symptoms until they randomly do? Yeah, absolutely. Herpes is definitely another case of that. Um, actually, tuberculosis is known oh, as a really? case that have like, yeah. Huh. So, yeah, it really is, it is really quite astonishing the amount of, like, we, the, the amount of factors, the amount of variables that go into whether someone gets a disease from a microbe or not. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so... Uh, you touched on it just briefly, um, but I'm actually interested also in some of the ways that a host is actually able to prevent infections from a specific pathogenic microbe. Yeah, so almost all organisms have their own form of an immune system that protects them against pathogenic microbes, even something, even uh, plants and bacteria have their own immune system. It's, it's definitely not like the same as ours, but you know, um, you know, like CRISPR and Cas9, that is something that was taken from what is actually considered like a bacterial immune system. It's like the bacteria's way of defending themselves against viruses. Uh, plants have their own immune system, and that's something that's been kind of, um, that's been really, really interesting to learn about. Um, but Is that the for, uh, concept um, of hormesis? I have no idea. I have never <laughs> heard of that term. I don't know what you're talking about. No, this could be because I, I, was reading, I was reading a bit about uh, plant immune systems because a lot of fungi um, infect plants. And, oh, okay. so reading, and so, yeah, so you read about that and they have like, there are some like, I don't want to say parallels, but like they do like, even though they're completely different than us, they do have their own form of immune system. They do have their own form of, uh, protecting themselves against pathogenic bacteria or fungi or viruses, and it's still it, it, it's it's so crazy just seeing how all these different organisms like have their, have evolved to create their own immune system. So when we think, so when we think of immune system, or at least when I think of immune system, the in humans there are kind of these two broad arms, I guess you would say. Um, there's what's called the innate side and the adaptive side. The innate side um, is very much the first response. So like the very first time you see a pathogen um, and, the, and, the way, and when it responds, that's the innate side. And what it, the innate uh, immune system does is it recognizes these conserved uh, structures in bacteria or fungi or a viruses. So um, the, one of the best examples of, um, of some of the structures they recognize are usually like um, this structure called LPS in bacteria, which is part of the bacterial cell wall. Um, our immune system can actually recognize the specific structure and trigger a response to this structure and be like, okay, we see this LPS thing. Okay, so we're gonna set off this immune system because we now know that there's bacteria in our system. So that's the innate side. The adaptive side is what we think is what basically allows us to have vaccines. Our, the adaptive side is the memory side. It, it's what it, it's what makes sure that the next time we see this thing, this bacteria, this virus, will be prepared. And so that's how you get, that's how you get, that's how um, our body produces things like antibodies specific to whatever pathogenic microbe that may enter us. So, um, our, so in humans, that's the, those are the two main components. This is very, this is very broad. And I feel like if, I, if my, any of my immunology professors are, would, would be listening <laughs> right now, they'd be like, well, don't you forget about this. Yeah. But so in our, so human immune system, that's the innate and the adaptive side, um, also, something that's really cool is that I kind of touched on this earlier is that we have our microbiome, which is, um, you know, the microbes that live within us, those actually help protect us from pathogenic microbes. They actually, you know, we have um, all these microbes on all these exposed surfaces of our body, like our eyes, our skin, our lungs, our stomach, and it's just swimming with all these microbes. And that actually prevents other microbes from coming in and establishing an infection within us. Hmm. Yeah, I, 
I've, I mean, I've, I've done very limited reading on like the microbiome, but it seems to me like that's going to be a frontier that uh, a lot of microbiologists are going to have to enter over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. We're going to be learning I feel like tons a lot on of them. That. Yeah, I think a lot of them are. So at our school mm-hmm. um, at University of Maryland Balt- in Baltimore, there's a lot of labs that are focusing on the microbiome that studies it and trying to really understand really the diversity of our microbiome there's so much like we we conventionally think of microbiome as just bacteria mm-hmm. or not we i think i think a lot, i think what has been put out there it's always been like oh the bacteria in us but actually the microbiome can constitutes of a lot of other organisms including fungi yeah yeah right so you, you briefly mentioned that um so the the uh, adaptive immune system ends up creating these antibodies. Um, that's to any pathogen, just if that's like a virus or if that's a bacteria or if that's a fungi, it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, that's that is a can <laughs> of worms. <laughs> like, okay. uh, let, okay, let, 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 let's put it this way: it should, it, it should. should. That is, it should. That is, that is what should happen. A lot of microbes have evolved so that like that sometimes that doesn't happen or like it, it, it's it's really it, it's so hard to put these broad um, statements on it because yeah. there's just so much out there so much that I'm still learning but yeah it's supposed to create these antibodies against these different organisms you know whether it's fungi viruses parasites or bacteria that would protect you from a potential second infection. So you're saying I need to evolve in certain ways <laughs> because I'm, <laughs> I'm sensing a bit of trepidation oh as in my, my body is I, not. I, I'm, I'm not, I, 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 I'm, I'm very afraid I'm going to put, I'm going to put myself in a can of worms with like my foot in my mouth all this. <laughs> okay. okay we'll, we'll move on then. So anyway, that, that, that was kind of a, a background on microbes and pathogens and hosts and just like our immune system and things of that nature. So now we can actually switch to the topic that I truly know nothing about. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, going to more of a fungal specific twist to, mm-hmm. to the podcast, which is what I, I'm really interested in learning about. So let's start real general again. <laughs> what is a fungus? It, it's, okay, so fungi are these large groups of diverse uh, organisms, specifically uh, eukaryotes. So, you know, organisms, um, just very briefly, you know, when we think of cells, um, they're usually divided as a prokaryote or eukaryote um usually there's some there's some other stuff there's some other stuff involved but for sake of simplicity prokaryotes and eukaryotes eukaryote uh, prokaryote, represent <laughs> <laughs> and, okay and um eukaryotes are um cells that have nucleus that have a nucleus and they have these um membrane bound organelles uh bacteria are considered prokaryotes Fungi are eukaryotes, um, and they are distinguished from other eukaryotic organisms such as plants and animals by the presence of this molecule called chitin in their cell wall. And that's really kind of the unifying, that, that, that's really the, what unifies them because beyond that, they're, uh, they are extraordinarily diverse um, organisms. So just kind of give you, just, just kind of give you a scope of that as, as to how diverse they are. There are seven kingdoms of life. Um, two, and um, one of the one of the kingdoms of life is called is like the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Uh, animal kingdoms include every like include include humans. It includes plant. It includes sorry, it includes birds. It includes you know, uh, manatee and like all these organisms are fall underneath this kingdom of animal. And it is obviously a very very diverse um, kingdom. Fungi are its own kingdom. It's <laughs> far, it, yeah. So, like, it's as far as like, there's so many things that constitute a fungi. So, uh, mushrooms are fungi. These things that we eat are, you know, ingest in other ways that you might, <laughs> other ways that you might partake. But like, mushrooms are fungi. So are yeasts that are used to make beer, and so are molds that are used to ripen cheese, but can also contaminate our food. So fungi are really integrated in like our everyday life and constitute just this wide, wide variety of organisms. They aren't plants, they aren't animals, they are its own entity. And they have profound implications on our environment, our health, and they've been utilized actually in a, in a wide 
way for manufacturing. Um, they've been, they've been because of because they can um, degrade organic matter. They've been um, looked at a lot as far as ways to utilize them for recycling. Um, they've also been used for therapeutic development. So the one of the best cases is um, antibiotics and penicillin. The story goes that Alexander Fleming, who was a scientist, I think in the 50s or so, he um, he left a petri dish um, that was growing some bacteria. I think it, I can't remember what it was. I think it might have been staff, but he basically left this dish with the bacteria without a lid on his lab bench. And over the weekend, something came in through the window and landed in this dish that was growing bacteria. And so this dish got contaminated with the with this mold that literally had flown in through the window. And so he came in the next day, and it came, he came in after the weekend and saw that his uh, Petri dish had been contaminated with, uh, with a mold. And this happens quite often. Anyone who works in microbiology will tell you they've always that they've gotten like a contaminated plate once or twice. And, but he noticed um, is that in this plate with bacteria, this plate had been like, you know, fully, um, had like a full like mat, I guess, of um, bacteria growing on it. He noticed that where the fungi had landed and started to grow, it had inhibited the bacteria growth around, it, like there, there was inhibited uh, bacteria growth around this fungi. He called it like a halo. And he hypothesized that there was something in this mold, this mold which was called penicillium. Um, mm. There was something in this mold that was releasing a substance that was blocking bacterial growth. So he isolated and purified the substance, and that became penicillin. So there, and like I'm, and so this is an example of how fungi have been used to um, help with to um, help in human health. And like I said earlier, there's also a lot of papers recently that have been highlighting the importance of fungi in our microbiome, which is usually talked about in the context of bacteria. So there, so what is a fungi? There's so there's so many of them out there. It's it's this real like wild field of all these different organisms that have such a wide variety of implications in health. I'm over here just trying to learn the human body and <laughs> you just added <laughs> an entire kingdom to, to my work. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is my, my kingdom here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So with, with, with that in mind, um, there's been a lot of like an increase in like fungal infections in the news. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any speculations as to why that might be? I think there's a lot of reasons why. Um, first of all, I feel like I should point out that there's actually no federal requir requirement for reporting fungal infections. So mm -hmm. with like bacteria, with a lot of bacteria like staph or you know pseudomonas stuff like that, like usually they're um, you you have to report them so that we get like a accurate idea of you know okay how many cases are there. We don't have to do that for fungi. Uh, so the magnitude of how prevalent they are in public and in, in health is is really underappreciated. And they've kind of been, I feel like they've been brushed aside a lot in infectious diseases. I mean, like I said, I didn't really know that much about infectious diseases until, I mean, not infectious diseases, but fungi until I started working in this lab in, in my PhD. And um, I think also another reason why they have, why you don't, why now there's been increased um, infections is that usually um, fungal infections tend to occur only in um, immunocompromised individuals, people who might be sick either with like HIV um, or who are maybe go undergoing like a transplant and so they have a, a compromised immune system. So I think for, for a while it was also that you know it's not impacting me so you know, I'm not going to really, so why do I care? Um, so I think a lot of increased awareness and more research and diagnostics have at least brought it to the news. But I also think one of the reasons why is that um, there is a break, I guess, in human resistance to fungal disease. Uh, the way I've been, the way I've learned it. Um, so Arturo Costa de Ball, he's the chair of the microbiology and immunology department at Johns Hopkins University. He's a very, very smart. Uh, a researcher and he put out this idea that the human resistance to fungal disease relies on these two pillars one and um, one is our advanced immune system which includes like an efficient um, innate and adaptive side that I mentioned earlier as well as what's called the endothermy and endothermal uh, barrier uh, that's the other pillar 
and mammals are able to maintain this elevated body temperature that can prevent infection from environmental microbes such as fungi that have not fully adapted to surviving in mammalian temperatures. So, you know, us warm-blooded creatures, like if that's actually a way that we can prevent uh, fungal infections and which are more adapted to, I guess, cooler um, temperatures. And when there's a break in what's called this endothermal barrier um, in the host, they can become more susceptible to fungal infection. And this, can, and this is seen a little bit in um, hibernating mammals. So bats, for example, they get more susceptible to fungal diseases during the winter. They, there's um, research showing that they get higher rates of what's called white nose syndrome. And so a break in either one of these pillars, either the efficient immune system or the endothermal barrier will make a human more susceptible to fungal disease. And so when I mentioned earlier that there's been a break in resistance, it's because now um, you see on one end, you see higher cases of immune suppressed individuals. So those who are suffering from AIDS, people who are, who are, um, who have cancer, they have, a, they have some, they have a compromised immune system or those, or people who are taking immunosuppressive drugs for whatever reason, they are susceptible to fungal diseases. Additionally, on the endothermal barrier side, um, many fungal species, we have, it has been shown that a lot of fungal species can, um, have been, can now survive at higher temperatures by being gradually exposed to warmer temperatures. So thinking the context of global warming, a lot of fungal species have adapted to these higher temperatures. They break that endothermal barrier that protects us um, from fungal diseases. And that allows a crossover where now humans are more susceptible to fungal diseases. And this has been something that's been proposed for a few fungi, actually. Um, Canada auris was considered a plant-associated organism for a while until about 10 years ago where there was almost a simultaneous emergence of the fungi on three separate continents at the same time. And research has shown that it can adapt quite well to um, high te higher temperatures. So that's kind of one, that's been kind of described as one of the first cases of a fungus that's able to adapt to higher temperatures. And because of that, they can adapt to living inside humans and cause infections. Me ask you something a bit off script real quick about that <laughs> that adaptation um i know that certain viruses can mutate very well um, and that's that's what allows them to to be able to propagate is that the same case for certain fungi like do you have certain fungi that do uh mutate a lot or like how do they adapt do, do you have oh, i mean yeah it's a, i mean it's a living organism yeah of course yeah it definitely can adapt i mean humans mutate and adapt all the time. Um, but yeah, fungus definitely can uh, adapt to its surroundings. And for example, like um, antifungal resistance actually is a huge problem with a lot of disease, with a lot of fungal diseases. Um, the drugs in the first place aren't that good to be honest, but there's also, but there's a lot of cases of, fung of fungi that are able to adapt and become resistant to um, drugs that are used to treat them. Okay, yeah. That's really interesting. Well, like I said, I'm definitely learning. Um, okay, okay, so let's, are. yeah, oh, yeah, that's the goal. Um, let's let's shift a little bit to mucor mycosis. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> yeah, mucor mycosis. <laughs> okay, all right. So, can you talk a little bit about what that is first off? Yeah, so mucor mycosis is a disease caused by fungi, which um, which fall under the mucorales order. Um, and these are just like, you know, terms used to classify, you know, organisms of life. And so the, the nomenclature, I guess, like order, kingdom, phylum, that's mm -hmm. kind of, it's just a method of classification. But mucormycosis is caused by fungi in this order of mucorales. And mucorales are these type of molds. Um, so earlier I mentioned yeast versus mold. A yeast is a single cell um, fungal organism. Um, molds are... Um, or fungal species that are multicellular. So um, mucorales are these molds that are found pretty much around the environment. They're very predominant in the soil, actually. In plants, they're known to cause uh, cases of root rot. In humans, however, it is the third most common um, invasive fungal infection. And it's, re and it's been kind of under the radar, but recently um, it was classified as an emerging infectious diseases by the um, um, the NIH. So 
you're pro so it's definitely become more prominent in the public health sphere as far as we know we're learning more about it um oftentimes the fun the fungi mucoralis is compared to another mold called aspergillus they are also compared to but however they are very very different even though like they're both considered they're both molds they are so different as far as their biology and actually there's been some studies shown that like from an evolutionary standpoint they diverged they have like millions of years of that of divergence between them so even though they're they're kind of put in the same category they're actually completely different but that is, but mucoralis mucormycosis basically is this very severe fungal disease which can um which is characterized by this invasion of um, the fungal hyphae. So hyphae are these um, long tubular structures seen in um, molds and where the fungus can be either inhaled, it can go in your eye, it can go through your nasal cavity, it can go uh, and it will start to grow into these hyphal forms. And this hyphae will start to, I get will start to grow in or around blood vessels, which leads to these blood clots and it cuts off the blood supply um, of that area and leads to severe um, tissue damage and death. And it's and very often it's um, when people get this disease, it's fatal. Hmm. Yeah, that's well, that's rough. <laughs> 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 that's that's like a that's like a sci-fi thriller right there. Yeah. <laughs> watching some person get infected and it uh, starts like building up around their vessels and then things it's, start <laughs> it's really like i've seen I've, I've used quite a i've used quite a few of these pictures of um eupermycosis and you know presentations i've had and presentations i've had to do and the photos are they're gnarly they're disgusting like it's disgusting yeah. it's like it's a very like it's rare it's not something that like will occur all the time but it really is this disfiguring it's this yeah it, it, it like you see these pictures of like this this guy i can think like i remember my my boss like sees this photo this guy who's like has a, a face a facial infection uh mm -hmm. infection in his face and like part of his face is like almost rotted off it can, it's it's it gets really really awful and so that's and so even though it is rare it's very very um it, 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 I mean, it has high rate. It's a high fate, uh, fatal rate, and also it's so painful. You know, it's not something that can be just easily treated. It's so, it's a very disfiguring disease. So, I hope um, people are gonna. Like, I, I hope that um, people are gonna realize that, like, even though it's not a common disease, it's still something that needs to be studied. Yeah. And I guess based off of what you were talking about, fungi in general, I mean, the prevalence is increasing overall. So mm -hmm. that's something that's certainly rising, just like the microbiome research. <laughs> it seems like all these different yeah. areas that we didn't know a whole lot about, yeah. we need to learn a lot more. In. Okay. So uh, how does, I know you mentioned like it goes around blood vessels and things of that nature, but do you have any other ways that uh, mucormycosis aff affects uh, the body or cells? To be honest, like the research on it is very, even though it's like the third most common invasive fungal infection, the research that's been done on like, as far as like how it interacts with cells in our body, it's, it's very, it's very sparse. Um, in the US, I think there's like our lab and one other lab in LA and there's, there might be a, and there might be a few other labs that study, I guess, like the fungal genomic side of it, but there's not that many labs that study, I guess, like the host microbe interaction. So there isn't really, honestly, that much known about it. There's stuff I could go into, which is, but it gets very nitty gritty. Um, my research, hopefully, what it's going to be focusing on is how fungi um, survive in these cells or how they interact with these cells called macrophages. Macrophages are these immune cells that they, I like to say they gobble things up, like they basically, um, they, they, they kind of patrol, they, as you could say, they patrol your body and they gobble up any like pathogenic microbe and like kind of eat it up and prevent it from, you know, causing any further harm. And our lab, before I got here, showed that um, spores from this, from these fungi, from these mucoralis fungi can actually persist and survive in the macrophages um, somehow. And 
in contrast to other fungi such as aspergillus, aspergillus doesn't do this, but the mucoralis fungi can actually persist in the macrophages. They can survive in it for quite some time. So we, to, to long story short, we don't really know that much as far as like how it interacts with the cells in our body. We have, like there's been, there are definitely some studies as far as like, oh, how it might um, get nutrients or something like that. But we don't have nearly as big of an idea of it as we do for other um, pathogens. Hmm. Uh, these spores are made up of like complex proteins or do you, have you looked at that? <laughs> uh, so a, I, I, like, I think of a spore as like, um, like a seed almost. It's like, yeah. it, like when you see it, when you look in figures, it's literally like this, this circle. And yeah. that like, is that, that's what will, I guess, settle in your body, let's say like in your lung and eventually will grow into like those high key structures I mentioned early, earlier. And so yeah, there are like, I mean, there's a lot of different structures uh, like proteins and in these spores uh, and, and that constitute these spores. Uh, to be honest, like that's something that my research is not focusing on, but like hmm. we're st also, like I said, these fungi are really understudied yeah. and we still don't know like the full extent of like what exactly are in these fungi or like what exactly constitutes the structures of these fungi. Okay. So, uh, although we don't know a whole lot about them, um, do you, are there any cures? I mean, I know you mentioned that before that the, the medicine already is kind of lackluster when it comes to fungi in general. Yeah, um, honestly, no. no. I mean, there are two FDA-approved drugs that are that are used, but they have very limited clinical success. And one of the reasons why fungi tend to be, why fungal drugs tend to be kind, tend to not be so good, is because they're very toxic. Fungal cells are actually they have a lot of similarities to human cells, and because of that antifungal drugs can cause a lot of toxic side effects. So the truth is, no, there aren't really that many cures to mycomycosis. What often is resorted to are is like surgical um, uh, debriefment, where they basically just cut it, they cut out the tissue. Mm. So, which you know, in itself, of itself can be very, yeah, it's, it's awful. So back to the so, crusades. <laughs> But it's, it, they're really, because it's also very fast, and it can also be a very fast growing fungi in these infections, too. So you get these, like, potentially, like, disfiguring um, treatment options. So really highlighting the need for potential therapeutics. Our lab has been um, focused on utilizing... Um, not I want to say focus, but one of our one of the research projects done by a grad student before me showed that there are some drugs, um, some actual actually um, cancer drugs, drugs that have already been FDA approved and used to treat um, to treat certain cancers can actually be used potentially, at least in mice, <laughs> um, to treat to uh, treat mucormycosis in mice because this drug targets the human host receptor that fungus um that the mucoralis fungi interact with and so by blocking things on the host side instead of the uh, on the host side um it's able to actually prevent um the disease from really disseminating uh, at least in mice mice are not men so this is all like yeah so this is all you know this is this study came out i think last year um it would be a long time before this could be like translated into in human studies, but there are efforts. It's just right. It's just not as much that it should be. Yeah. I imagine with that kind of stuff, if you're going to be blocking something on the host, you're probably also going to be having some side effects that, that might come as a result. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, you did mention that they're they're pretty prevalent, but they don't mm -hmm. they're in terms of like infecting us, it's pretty rare. Um, mm -hmm. So why don't we get sick from them all the time? Well, usually they don't impact I say usually, they don't impact healthy people. There have been a few cases where mucormycosis occurs in healthy individuals, but most of the time the um, people who get sick from from the mucoralis fungi and develop mucormycosis, they have underlying risk factors. So one, some of them are diabetes, um, 
uh, people, individuals who are immunosuppressant. So if they like maybe they recently had a transplant, so they're on immunosuppressants. Um, neutropenia, which is um, this disease where you have a low level of neutrophils, which is an important immune cell in the initial immune response. Um, people who have cancer, um, also trauma. I get like you. You've actually see quite a few cases of mucormycosis um, after natural disasters. So like. I think in 2011, there was a tornado in Missouri, and there was a small outbreak after, in some of the survivors of that um, tornado because of all the debris flying everywhere. Um, you get, like, like I said earlier, these fungi usually found in the soil. <clears throat> So it got kind of picked up and it gets caught in like, you know, scrapes and bruises and, scra and scrapes. And I think there's actually been quite a few cases of mucormycosis in soldiers as well. But usually there's an underlying risk factor in this disease. I say usually. There's, de there's definitely been cases where um, mucormycosis is found in healthy individuals. And we don't know what the, we don't know like whether they had a risk factor as well or if there's some, or if they had like some unknown risk factor. Um, but usually healthy people don't get it because we have like a robust immune response. It's able to prevent, uh, to prevent these really serious infections and these really serious disease forms. Uh, do we know if it can be passed from human to human? From human to human. I mean, it would depend on the human, I guess. Hmm. So that'd be incredibly rare, if, if at all. Uh, you know what? Honestly, I haven't like I haven't looked into that, and I haven't seen cases of that. But I imagine like if if you're talking about like one human who's sick and another human who has one of these underlying risk factors, mm -hmm. I imagine like that could definitely happen. Okay. But usually, it usually comes from an environment. Usually, the cases I've seen at least it comes from the, um, an environmental source. Okay. No. Oh, all right. Okay. So, uh, well, just two more questions, but the. Next one specific to, to fungal research. Um, you mentioned that it's, it seems like at least that it's kind of in its infancy in terms of like understanding all these, these different fungi. Um, where do you think that the research is going and do you feel like hopeful in particular aspects or are we just doomed by the fungal kingdom? I, so I was a lot more hopeful before COVID happened. Just, and then uh. that, like, I feel like I feel like there's going to be a lot of research that's going to be going into viruses recently, and, and you know, like it should, because there obviously there's a lot of stuff that we need to understand. Um, but to be honest, actually, I do think that there's going to be more understanding on fungal pathogens, especially because it's been it's been highlighted as potential like secondary um, infections in a lot of these severe. Uh, respiratory, I guess, these severe um, viral respiratory infections. So uh, a lot of times in infections like the flu, and even now in COVID, um, you get, a lot of times you get these cases of secondary infections. You know, your immune system, your, the, the, res the immune system is so ravaged after this um, initial infection. And then you get the secondary infection, this um, either bacteria or fungi that can come in and kind of take advantage of the fact that the host is a bit weakened after this first infection. And I was actually today, someone pointed out to me that there is a paper published a few weeks ago from a group in Germany that found um, several cases of aspergillus, which is another fungus, the, another fungal mold of aspergillus in COVID-19 patients. Um, as a, it, it manifested as one of these secondary infections. So I do think that there are, there will be, um, there, there, I, I do think there's going to be more research done on fungal infections. I do, obviously now it's probably going to take a pause with COVID-19 going on, but I do think that um, we do, we are getting a higher appreciation for these for these um, organisms, especially as their potential to be pathogens and to be really dangerous, especially and um, like I said earlier, we're talking about like the global warming issue and more more there are more people who for whatever reason are immunocompromised, whether that, because they have to take certain drugs or because of increased cancer rates. You're going to see a lot more. I'm afraid that you're going to see a lot more cases where um, loved ones, you know, are going to get these infections, and that's going to really bring a highlight to fungal research. Yeah, again, that's really interesting. Do you, um, is there a particular area in, in fungal research that you're most excited about? Like something that, that I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, just generally gets you excited. 
Yeah, I, I get really in, I get really excited as far as learning how, and this is kind of what my research is going to be as far as like how fun, fungus are able to evade our host immune system and how they're able to really like at least in mucormycosis, there's really nothing known as far as like the host immune response to um, these these uh, fungi. So I'm really excited to learn more about that, and that's what my research will be focusing on. Um, I'm also really interested to see how a lot of these fungi that are can be utilized in um, either medicine or you know biotechnology. I really think that there's a lot of potential with these organisms in health, as, in human health, as far as like what they could do, and yeah, I think I, I, I think it, it almost feels like a last frontier in microbiology because, like, bacteria, like, I mean, bacteria, viruses, like, everyone kind of knows about not not everyone knows about that, but those are things that are kind of like well established and things that are well studied, but not that many people study fungus. So it does feel like a kind of frontier, one of these like last frontiers in microbiology. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it's kind of a cool way to put it. <laughs> Lewis and Clark. Yeah, uh, I, I, I know, and I, and the thing is, I know there's going to be someone out there who's setting some obscure bacteria. <laughs> he's like, no, and I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> no, and I'm like, you know what? Sophriticus <laughs> peticatus. <laughs> is that? I, you know what? If I ever discover, if I ever discover some weird fungus or something like that, I'm going to name it exactly that. In your okay. honor. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, okay, so just to like cap things off, I I'll have like an like I mentioned, I'm gonna have an introduction with uh, AWIS and whatnot. So, um, if you could talk a little bit about like what you're doing with that, like what it is, and you know what what kind of gets you excited about that too. Yeah. So AWIS stands for Association of Women in Science, and it is a professional organization um, nationally that is. Wait, did you hear the dog? <laughs> No. No, oh, sorry. So I'm fostering a dog right now, and she's right now underneath my desk, and she really wants. To, she just like she brought her like toy to me. She really yeah. wants to play with her. <laughs> yeah, she's like right there right now. But anyway, so it's an organization that supports the advancement of women in STEM fields, so science, technology, engineering, and math. And basically, with um, it promote it. it highlights and promotes women who want to really facilitate who want to go further in their career that either by creating potential career development um opportunities um mentoring and also opportunities for leadership and so i am the one of the vice presidents in the um, baltimore chapter and we're still kind of like getting stuff up and running and we i'm so we were gonna have we we're gonna have so many events planned uh, before COVID 19 uh -huh. happened and then of course you know we had to cancel them but yeah. our our hope is to create a networking of his um uh, I guess, facility, not facility, like a, a networking opportunity for women in science, because a lot of times, because a lot of times, especially women who want to go up into the higher um, positions in science, you know, if they want to be like start their own lab or something like that, there's very few of them out there. So AWIS kind of helps to um, support women like this, either by, you know, providing um, career development training or leadership opportunities. And so it's really exciting to be part of that and to help in, and to help in this uh, field because there just are so very few women who get to really who, not. Oh, there's there's not that many there there's not as much um, support from women in higher um, I guess higher uh, opportunity. I'm sorry, in like lab and higher lab positions as far as like starting their own lab and stuff like that a lot of this is for many reasons but it's nice to be part of this and tonight and um hopefully once things calm down we'll get to do more um case we'll get to do more events yeah yeah hopefully and that's that's specific to baltimore or do you know if there are any other like chapters I, other oh areas? no it's national it, well it's national um but i work specifically with the case with the organization in baltimore okay cool <laughs> Well, with that, uh, 
I think we can, we can end things, but thanks for coming on the podcast and hopefully other people find this stuff as informative as I did. Like I said, <laughs> especially the second half of that, that was just, every word was just new information to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun. Thanks for coming on. I, I, ho- I hope I didn't over, I hope I didn't overdo it. <laughs> I, no. think I didn't overload you with all this new fungus stuff. <laughs> no, 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 no. Although now it does make me question if I, like I have a whole other kingdom that I need to start studying, which is going to be really unfortunate because i already feel like i've got way too much stuff on my plate <laughs> i feel like that's just sci- i feel like that's 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 the true scientist in you that's true yeah <laughs> all right well till uh, next time everyone and uh hopefully you enjoyed this podcast and i will have uh, all the alex's links in the description box and till next time see ya